Hi, welcome to Straight Talk. This is uh, Randy Bell speaking to you. Uh, you know the um, hidden agenda of many American churchgoers today seems to be to be spiritually blessed in their lives, but exit each week from the worship gatherings unchanged, unscathed, and unchallenged. Seems like their favorite verses are, first of all, all things are lawful for me, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. And then the second, probably most popular verse would be, judge not, that you be not judged from Matthew 7. And thirdly, a reaction to those two things are together is my God loves me just the way I am, so for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice, from Romans 7. In other words, their mantra is no one is perfect. Even Paul did not obey God from you, what you read here. So stop judging me for all my lifestyle and what you call weaknesses. Accept me the way I am. Well, living by excuses, <clears throat> they follow the world and its attitudes, values, and pleasures, and it seems to be the standards they practice and love. And, and there's no deep desire to change, repent, or be moved by God's moral high ground and culture. Uh, the kingdom life is rejected and exchanged for the wicked American culture. Vegas, Hollywood, booze, liberalism, occultism, pleasure, and greed are what captures their attention, their minds. It excites their taste in music and movies and drives them to make all kinds of sacrifices, including finances and time, to practice and enjoy these things. They'll spend hundreds of dollars for concerts, parties, and pleasure trips. The books they read, the places they go, and the pleasures they seek make them so say repeatedly, I don't have time to spend for Christ, I'm too busy. The pleasure and enjoyment of their children also seems to trump everything from the Bible and God's Word. And there's no guilt for any of these choices that you see around in many of the churches. They, they feel God is here to bless them and make them rich, happy, and fulfilled in their pursuit of the American dream. But see, the sad fact is they hold to their ideas and refuse to make radical changes in their lives. Is this ignorance, uh, immaturity, or, or worse? So let's take a moment and look at the popular scriptures used today by the unchanged church attenders. Uh, and let's really look at the context. So when we look at excuse one, what says all things are lawful for me from 1 Corinthians 6, 12, let's begin at the first verse of the chapter. It says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. Uh, in other words, some in the church at Corinth were suing others of the church by going into court and causing all kinds of havoc and hatred <clears throat> inside the church. Paul rebuked them and, and asked them if, if they're ignorant. He reminded them that don't they realize one day they're going to judge the world with Christ in, in the future kingdom and even rule over mighty angels of heaven. <clears throat> So why can't they even get along and solve simple problems? And if they can't, then uh, obviously a radical change of attitude must be taken. And he says, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? This is in verse 7. He's saying, you're ruining the name of Jesus. Why don't you at least be silent and not go to court? So, so, so far, the context of the scripture is not all things are lawful, but stop acting like the selfish world because they are wrong. Then, Paul reminds the church, in the past, they were like the wicked. He goes and says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, and such were some of you, notice were, but you were washed, 
but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's verses 9 through 11. As you can now see, the Bible demands a radical change of action by the gospel of Jesus. And because of that, let's again, the, let's look at the context. See, the context in teaching is clearly not all things are lawful here. Do you actually think he's arguing that suing Christians, practicing immoral sex outside of marriage, uh, committing adultery and practicing homose homosexual relations, stealing and coveting uh, are lawful? Or how about these? Greed, drunkenness and partying, foul mouth abuse and conning people. You think he's saying these are lawful? He demands that the reader must understand the past practices are gone, but the present life in Christ radically changes a man, and they do not practice any of, any of these unlawful things. So let's, again, be careful. Let's look at the scripture. He also says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for all Christians, neither filthiness nor fo foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And then he says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. This is Ephesians chapter 5. Notice there's a difference between the children of disobedience. You see, the unchanged church attenders of Corinth are making the same argument that people do today. They're saying all things are lawful for me. That was the false doctrine brought into the church by wicked men. Their argument was clear. Grace has nothing to do with their actions. They are free from the law. And, therefore, their conclusion, sin does not impact their eternal future. But that's not the context of what Paul taught. He says, self-indulgence is the old lie practiced here in Corinth. And, and Paul, he dis destroys this lie. Look at, quote, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. That's verse 13. So now, here we have it again. For the third time in this section, Paul continues his argument and demands change. Total and complete change. He declares that all things are not lawful but sinful and wrong. Do you not know, he says, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Flee sexual immorality, he says. He goes on and says, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And then he says, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? That's verse 15 and then 18 and 19. See, the change demanded is first an ownership. As a narrow road follower of Jesus, you do not even own your body anymore, if you are really a true born-again Christian. And next... You do not make your choices equal to God's choices. Instead, Christ died for you with an awful price, and you are ordered to live to glorify Him. And that means, according to the scripture, stop your sin and fulfill the kingdom demands of your Lord. Yes, Jesus the Messiah. And do it now. Let's look at the second excuse, number two. Judge not that you be not judged from Matthew 7, 1. Listen, they try to cover up their sins, and they quote this American favorite, easing their consciences. To believe that you are only, uh, only answer to God and that you have the right to decide what is right and wrong according to your opinions is such a lie, I'm so sorry that I even have to deal with it. 
God is clear in his Bible if you really want to know the truth. We need to look at the context each time in Scripture. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I wrote to you in my previous letter not to associate, in other words, closely and habitually with an unchaste or impure person. That, not meaning uh, altogether shun immoral people of this world or, or the greedy graspers and cheats and thieves or idolaters, because uh, otherwise you'd have to get out of the world and human society altogether. And so notice Paul saying, I'm not talking about living in a cave somewhere and be a monk. He says, and he goes on and says, but now I write to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of Christian brother. And if he is known to be guilty of immorality or greed, or, or is an idolater, you know, or whose soul is devoted to any object that steals the place of God, or is a person with a foul tongue, railing, abusing, slandering, and so forth, or is a drunkard or a swindler or a robber, uh, no, you must not so much as eat with this kind of person. And he goes on to say, what business of mine is it, and what right have I to judge outsiders? Is it not those inside the church upon whom you are to pass disciplinary judgment? In other words, passing a sentence on them as God gives you by fact. God alone sets in judgment on those who are outside, but drive out that wicked one from among you. In other words, expel him from your church. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13, through 13, that's the Amplified Bible. Our conduct is judged by God. And before we were even born, His Word clearly tells us what is right and wrong. It doesn't matter if you do not feel convicted of a matter, uh, like you need a feeling of guilt before you, you must comply to God's Word, His law. Nor, nor does it matter if you think it's pharisaical, you know, legalistic, to obey God's law because you're free. The Pharisees were judged by Jesus for disobeying His Word, not obeying it too much or consistently. Read Matthew 23 as Jesus exposes their hypocrisy of disobedience. Remember, we are told in 1 Corinthians 5.13 to judge those who claim to be a Christian. He called the professed Christian that wicked one and commanded them to throw him out of the church community without mercy if they would not stop practicing those sins. In, in other words, when someone will not stop their sin, we do not have the right to choose to tolerate and accept them. God, not us, has already judged the matter and given us clear instructions. And, and by the way, this is what it means to judge. Our God has already made the judgment and recorded it in His Word. You either defy Him or comply by obeying Him in the action He orders us to do as a local, ch a local Christian church needs to do. And let's make sure this is clear. God has already judged the world and passes the sentence of eternal death for all spiritual crimes. Therefore, we are not to judge them by killing them or shunning them or any other type of punishment. And before you jump up and ask, well, wait a minute, uh, we have to let robbers hurt people or thieves or murderers? No, we do not tolerate or accept evil. But the secret here is simple. The holy judge hands off the physical judgment to human authority, not individual actions, for crimes God issues orders to the government. The Bible is very clear when he says the government is to take charge in the area of crimes. He says in Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, Whoever resists the authority actually resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. In other words, from the government authority. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. 
For because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. And then he goes on to say this, Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. That's the first seven verses of Romans 13. Remember, Paul and his people were a slave nation to Rome, and he still explains God's agent of capital punishment for the wicked is the government. They are God's hand of judgment by using force against the wicked criminals who are charged, and they're charged to protect us from these. Our citizens need protection. You do not have to agree with the wicked government who rule you, but you are still required by God, yeah, you had to pay your full taxes to keep order and justice for all. That's God's word clearly given. And remember, Christian, we are not in this world to condemn the world, but we are commissioned to preach repentance and to help them stop their evil and selfish acts and receive Christ's forgiveness. Jesus did not come to condemn, but to save. The kingdom life is a whole new way of life with a powerful culture that people dream to be a part of. The church, government, and family authorities are instructed in the Bible to make judgments that are based clearly on God's word, which affect you, me, and everyone in this world today. Well, let's look at the last one, excuse number three. Remember it said, for the good that I will do, I can't do. But the evil I will not want, that I always practice. So this excuse says, my God loves me just the way I am because I can't change anyway. Listen, a loving parent does not just sit back and watch their children starve or be injured or expose to evil. They protect them. For you to believe that God sits back and leaves you powerless to suffer under Sin and evil is a slap in his face. To focus on Romans 7, again out of the full context, is a sad excuse. He says, for what I am doing I do not understand. For what I will to do that I do not practice. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do that I will practice. That does say that in, in Romans 7, 15 and 19. But God loves you too much to abandon you to the devil in his darkness. Why would you hide behind these few sentences of Paul and actually think Paul lived his Christian life a slave to sin, always frustrated and unable to do good? Read the rest of his words. You can't stop there. Paul didn't stop there and camp there. Under his old life as a Jew, Paul understood the law of God and its rightness. But he did not have the power or strength to change and obey it. He explains that Jesus made the way for all to change. Right in the same context, Paul uses the law of adultery as a simple illustration. And explains if you divorce your wife to marry another, you actually commit sin. But if your spouse dies, you can remarry, and this is fine and okay with God. Notice his words, therefore... My brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now... We have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Romans 7, 4 through 6. Notice clearly what Paul is saying. Paul is explaining the past life, not the present kingdom life. When you were in the flesh, not, is not the same as you are now in the Spirit. Born-again believers receive the grace of God by the Spirit now dwelling inside of them. Knowing and understanding the law of God will not save you, but it will convince you of the horror and destruction of sin. 
it will make you cry out eventually, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death that I'm in with this sin? That's Romans 7, 24. And guess what? And when you finally cry that way, you are finally ready to receive freedom from sin and the power to live in obedience. When you finally hate the sin, you're getting prepared and convinced to be born again. Now he says, now please listen to the rest of the story. Verse 8, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Verse 3 says, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies that we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus died on the cross for us. Verse 4 says he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful old nature, but instead follow the Spirit. That's Romans 8, 1 through 4. Now, don't you understand yet what God is trying to tell you? Knowing what is right and wrong, but not having the grace of God inside you, giving you the desires and power to do His will, leaves you still a slave to sin. Without Christ, Paul was good and, uh, good and a faithful Jew, but powerless to obey God. That is why he went on to explain in chapter 8 of Romans these words, quote, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. That's verses 5 and 6. Here's the fact. The natural person, not born again, is driven and enslaved to the normal human nature. So the results of this person, atheist or one who believes in God, has the same worldview and lifestyle. Living as an enemy of God because spiritual crime is their lifestyle are children of disobedience. That, that's why Paul says, quote, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. That's verses 7 and 8. Now, here comes the amazing truth that will kill excuse number 3. Romans 8 continues and says in verse 9, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Did you hear it? If you are born again, you lost control. The power of your sinful nature is killed. If you have the Spirit of God living in you, he continues and says, and remember, that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. You're not Christians. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. That's verses 8 through 10. Okay, please, you got to hear this. If you are born again, the flesh is your old past. The narrow road follower of Jesus has kingdom life. And this powerful grace life is yours forever. Now, not later. God's grace is constantly released in you because he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's verse 11. Okay, so to stay in the flesh with all those excuses of sin, exposes your real state of mind and heart. You're not born again. Your mind may agree with God's truth like Paul did until his conversion, but your church affiliation and good deeds will not release you from sin or God's judgment. Your only hope is to actually be saddened and sorrowful 
for your sins and stop making excuses. If you do not repent, you will stay unchanged, unscathed, and unchallenged while you blindly march to eternal death with a smile on your face. <sighs> Listen, for more answers, I challenge you, go straight to the book, the Bible. Thank you for listening to Straight Talk for Narrow Road Followers of Jesus. And if you have questions, make sure you email them to us at kloptv.org. God bless.